Thank you, thank you for the opportunity to uh, put this proposed work plan and structure in front of you. Um, uh, I have to say at the outset, uh, I mean, we've, we've done this uh, uh, and it is really a preliminary work plan and it's somewhat high level. And that's because we, uh, I, it, I think it's a work in progress and it's going to evolve as we go forward. Um, uh, and some of the points we've already covered in the discussion, so I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. Um, uh, and the first is, you know, the, the starting point for this commission, which is that uh, a just climate transition is a sense, it's sort of a founding policy statement. It's embedded in the terms of reference that the president gave the commission. Um, the president has made uh, various pronouncements on this, including last week at uh, Biden's climate summit, but he's been making uh, these pronouncements for a while. Uh, I mean, I've put up a quote there from 2019. And uh, in trying to understand the, the human dimensions of the transition, I actually found <clears throat> this slide uh, that I've got on the right hand side really, really useful because it's about workers and anticipating shifts in, in employment and how to maximize uh, the areas where we do create jobs and minimize the areas where we're going to lose jobs. Um, but it's also about communities and particularly vulnerable communities uh, and constituencies. Um, and uh, the point was made in the chat earlier that there are you know, uh, gender issues, there are youth issues, uh, there, there, there are a range of very vulnerable communities we've got to think about. Um, we also have to think about the impact on uh, consumers and changing consumption patterns. And then there's broader issues around the whole of society and citizens more broadly and how they engage in the process. Um, and the, the other slide I found really useful was this unpacking of the process around the just transition, uh, which I lifted from the ILO and uh, ma made a few tweaks. Um, and you know, uh, the ILO was really where the debate around the just transition first started, uh, they made uh, a number of seminal interventions that have informed labor positions around the world. Um, and it's about three basic steps. It's understanding the nature and the scale of the impacts. Uh, and as I said, areas where we're gonna grow, areas where we uh, face potential job losses. It's about creating a dialogue between social partners that takes us to a social consensus around the transition. And then it's the policies and measures that we need to implement to ensure that the transition is just and that we leave no one behind, uh, that we minimize unavoidable loss of employment and facilitate changes in the labor market. Um, so in, in terms of the overall approach, uh, that we're suggesting and uh, which would be embedded in the charter that uh, we'll hopefully discuss at our next commission meeting is the idea of building a social compact. Uh, so whatever we do has to be aimed at building consensus, uh, creating a partnership around the transition process and the systemic changes that will be required. Uh, doing it in a way that maximizes participation and, and transparency. So for us, that means allowing a diversity of views to be expressed in a structured and transparent way and soliciting as broad a range of stakeholder inputs as possible, using technology to enable participation. And for those communities that don't have access to technology, deliberately reaching out to vulnerable and marginalized communities. The, the other principle which some of the commissioners have made in the discussion is that we've got to have a science base to, to what we do. 
So uh, as the Secretariat, we should aim to support decision making with the best available research and information from whatever sector uh, it is available. But at the same time, we don't want to duplicate. So we uh, will build on existing work and processes already underway. And this is a point the chair has emphasized a number of point, times in this meeting. Um, in terms of the broad areas of work, I mean, we, we went through the terms of reference and uh, have uh, uh, sort of distilled it into five core areas that we need to focus on. So the, the first is the vision and framework, and that involves building a common understanding of, the tr of what a just transition means and where we're going to. Uh, you know, how we define the, the, a climate resilient economy and society. Taking that vision and framework into detailed planning around pathways that enable the Commission to recommend feasible and just climate resilient pathways. Um, uh, as part of that process, uh, specifically looking at jobs and skills identifying the employment risks and the opportunities, and looking at the skills requirements and the social adjustment costs. Also looking at what's traditionally referred to as means of implementation. I don't like that word because I think it bundles too many things together. But in particular, the, the technology that we need to support the pathways and the climate finance and investment that's got to enable them to happen. And lastly, there's a, a role in terms of monitoring and reviewing progress towards the vision and the goals and advising government, you know, critically on where progress is falling short of targets that we've already set. So, just a few words on, on the framework itself. I mean, we, we discussed earlier the National Planning Commission process. Um, uh, they, as they mentioned, already embedded the idea of the just transition in chapter five of the National Development Plan. There's been a detailed planning process subsequently. There's been broad areas of convergence um, uh, uh, around the vision and they had three detailed pathways that they engaged in the planning around, which was water, land use and energy. There's also a, a range of sectoral planning work that's already underway. So for instance, DMRE has launched the uh, adjust energy transition process. Uh, there was an um, uh, energy transition council meeting yesterday. Uh, with international development partners. There have been uh, detailed sector jobs resilience plans uh, done by TIPS on behalf of the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. Um, and there are a number of uh, really important pilot initiatives underway around the Mpumalanga coal fields. And there's the work that was mentioned earlier around the decommissioning of the power stations. So the, the two pieces of work that we have already proceeded to commission, the first is a desktop review of all of the existing work that is underway on the just transition. And as a second part to that exercise, to then develop what we call a, a just transition framework that would guide the work of this commission and its partners. And when we talk about a framework, we're, we're uh, meaning six particular elements uh, that would be part of it. So the first is a vision for a net zero climate resilient economy and society by 2050, um, which would include intermediate targets and milestones. Uh, now, uh, as discussed earlier, a lot of this was already developed by the, 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 the NPC, and the aim would be to build on that process um, I understand there's already broad stakeholder uh, support for the draft vision statement, and there were a few areas of bracketed text that uh, have been left for, for us to pick up on. 
Secondly, to map out the principles and criteria that would underpin decision-making uh, around the transition. And uh, to sort of bring it to the hard part, this is really about how do we manage trade-offs in the context of scarce resources? Um, we, we spent a lot of time discussing, discussing energy earlier. Uh, um, I mean, we all know that our water resources are going to become more constrained. Uh, they're uh, critically important water needs, such as the need for communities uh, and, and, and potable water, and the needs for agriculture. Uh, how do we balance those? We don't want to completely destroy agricultural jobs. Um, but, you know, uh, so, you know, there are some really difficult issues and the point would be to map out the principles and criteria that underpin that. Thirdly, to, I, to map out the planning process, uh, which as Melissa uh, said earlier, puts justice at the core. So we, we wanna describe what, what that planning process looks like and linked to that is what the principal pathways for change are. Um, uh, that would you know, be areas that the commission then undertake more detailed planning on. So you know, we, we heard earlier that the planning commission had mapped out three particular pathways, energy, um, uh, water, and land use. Um, uh, you know, in, at a broad level, we've got to deal with energy systems, mining and industrial processes, land use, water, ecosystems, built environment, and infrastructure. Uh, how we break those up and what segments we look at uh, is, is what we need to identify. Um, fifthly, we, we think the framework should set out a theory of change that maps out the broad enablers, such as sector governance, the economic and financial drivers, uh, science, technology, and information, and information and, and monitoring systems. And also at an aggregate level, the support measures that would be required to address social and economic disruption. And this would include not just government policy, but firm level readiness, reskilling, social safety nets. So the, those are the elements of the framework. Uh, that we're proposing, it, it might seem like a lot to adopt, but it would create uh, an incredibly solid platform for the planning for the commission uh, to then take up. And we envisage that framework then being cascaded into planning systems around pathways. And uh, yeah, I'm just putting these up as generic pathways. Uh, we'll we'll reach finality on exactly what pathways to pursue in the planning process as we develop the framework. Um, we envisage a, I mean, this is a generic slide on the kind of planning process we could follow within each pathway. So we would try and map system risk and vulnerability to climate change. We take the aggregate theory of change in the framework and apply it in the pathway. So what, you know, how do we understand change and what are the systemic changes that are required? What enables that change? Um, and I've put some examples there. What are the concrete mitigation, adaptation and development targets we need to need, uh, adopt? What are the support measures, jobs and skills? And what's the sequence of actions, the, the thresholds at which we have to make decisions and the strategic choices that have to be confronted. So all of this would constitute then a set of recommendations uh, once developed that the commission would, would take to government and to other social partners. Um, just to note, that, you know, in going through those pathways, there are a number of cross-cutting issues. So, uh, and I've just flagged some of them here that, and these cross-cutting issues would need to be coordinated across all of the pathways. So we're, we're looking at a little bit of a matrix structure. So 
across all the pathways, we've got to understand climate risk and vulnerability. We've got to have a detailed mitigation modeling capacity and adaptation planning. We need to be able to map the social development and support measures, identify the climate finance and investment and technology and innovation, and have a system for measuring and monitoring and reporting back in terms of the achievement of the objectives. Um, just on employment, livelihoods and skills, I mean, this is obviously a central concern. Um, uh, almost every commissioner raised it when I met with them. And, um, uh, you know, this isn't a full plan for what we need to do, but just at a high level, we should be, uh, first of all, reviewing the work to date on jobs, livelihoods and strategies. Um, uh, uh, assessing, uh, there's already a national employment vulnerability assessment that's been drafted. We should process that as the commission and update it with the latest information. It's now a year or two out of date. Um, there are already five sector job resilience plans on the table. There's also decommissioning plans that ESCOM is busy with. Um, so the commission should provide a platform for engagement between the social partners on these existing plans and further uh, plans that might come out. Um, we should advise around the skills development, social plans and livelihood support requirements. And importantly, we should test all of this. So we should be working as a commission with social partners on pilot areas and hotspots that test, uh, you know, that, that, that do proof of concept and monitor and evaluate success. Um, and, you know, just to note, there's an enormous amount of work already underway here. Some of it a little bit uncoordinated, but if any of you have been following the TIPS stuff, I mean, they've done some amazing piloting work, which uh, we should pull into the commission as we go forward. Um, on climate finance and investment, I'm, I'm just flagging this as, as a key area because it's a big focus amongst various social partners as we build up to COP26. Um, there is already an enormous amount of work being undertaken by NBI, by National Treasury. We don't want to duplicate it, um, but uh, uh, at, at a sort of high level, I'm suggesting that the Commission provides a forum for role players to align and coordinate their activities, um, that uh, there's existing work on the taxonomy for climate finance instruments. I think as a commission, we should be leaning in and promoting the adoption of that taxonomy. Uh, there are already voluntary disclosure mechanisms under development by National Treasury. It's important to popularize that and promote that. Uh, there is a need to track climate finance flows annually. There was a, a report put out uh, a year ago by Green Cape and others, which, which tracked this. It was unfortunately a one-off report. So I think the important thing is to make sure that we have an ability to track these flows annually and to identify the key levers that can unlock uh, further private investment and recommend measures to improve the project pipeline, uh, which seems to be one of the key obstacles in, in accessing further finance. Um, just lastly, on monitoring and evaluation, um, it's, it's vital that the commission is able to uh, monitor progress towards the just transition and particularly the achievement of mitigation and adaptation targets. To do that, we should develop an m and &E framework. Uh, there is already, of course, a lot of monitoring already underway. The DFFE does it. Um, most of the social partners have their own monitoring systems in place. So we don't want to duplicate that. We want to build on them. Um, uh, but what we do need to do is give the commission the capacity to critically review progress on an annual basis and point to where the gaps are. 
Um, and uh, we want to float the proposal that we should prepare an annual report on the state of implementation of the climate response strategy and progress towards a net zero goal. And that would be a report in the first instance to the president and, and government, but it would also be a report to the people of South Africa. Um, uh, there is a, a DFFE annual M&E report that they are required to produce. And of course, there are the national communications and the uh, biannual update report. And the commission also has a role in inputting into the DFFE report uh, and of course, critically appraising and, and making comments on the national communications and the biannual update report. Um, that um, brings me then to the working groups. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, we want to make a proposal around working groups, and I know that we're never going to satisfy everyone in the way that we set this up. Um, but just some preliminary uh, remarks first. So. Uh, the, the work of the Commission should be assisted by both permanent and ad hoc working groups. So some of the working groups we set up can be for a particular purpose with a start and end date. Others can be standing working groups. Um, we suggest that commissioners are allocated to working groups based on their areas of interest and expertise, but that in doing so, we make sure that there's a balance between the social partners in each working group. Um, so I suggest we, we'll do this as a poll after the meeting once we've agreed on what the working groups are, and we allow commissioners to indicate their you know, first and second preferences, and then we'll do an allocation. Um, our suggestion is that each working group is chaired by a commissioner who has the primary responsibility for port, reporting back to the overall commission. Um, that we uh, deliberately bring in additional experts and stakeholder representatives into the different working groups. We already have that power in terms of our terms of reference. We'll clarify that further in the charter that we develop. And from the secretariat side, uh, we will allocate a member to each of the working groups and a senior lead researcher that would support the, the, the working group. Um, and uh, as their first step, we'd get the working groups to agree on outputs and to adopt a work plan. Um, this is a suggested high level structure. Um, and I know it looks a little bit busy, but we're basically proposing that we do it in two phases. That uh, uh, as a phase one, we set up three working groups. The first on the just transition framework, which would oversee the development of the framework that I described earlier. Uh, the second on livelihoods and skills, which would uh, take charge particularly of the employment issues and activities that I indicated earlier. And the third on finance and investment. Um, uh, and we're, we're putting finance and investment on the table because it is a critically urgent area that a number of commissioners raised in my consultation. Uh, we did want to put a fourth working group on technology and innovation in place. Um, we suggest that that's probably a phase two rather than a phase one, which is not to downgrade it in terms of its importance, it's just uh, to uh, so that the pace of, of setting up these working groups doesn't overwhelm either the commission or the secretariat. Uh, we are already engaging with the NRF. We'll follow up after Minister Zimande's comments with the BSI, and uh, we will be developing this area. Um, and then obviously flowing out of the just transition area, there'll be planning taking place on particular pathways. So we would come back and recommend a sort of phase two set of working groups for particular pathways. So that's the proposal on the working groups. Um, 
just at a high level then, uh, the just transition framework working group would develop a common framework for the just transition. It would ensure consistency in addressing justice issues across the different planning pathway planning processes. And it would provide a forum for engaging around pilot projects and proof of concept. Um, so we'd pull in a lot of the uh, piloting work that's already going uh, into that as well as the development of the framework. Livelihoods and skills would assess vulnerability and opportunities for employment and livelihoods, provide a forum for engagement around sector jobs, resilience plans, engage educational institutions around the skills pipeline and recommend social support measures. The Committee on Finance and Investment would monitor climate finance trends, it would support the work that's taking place on taxonomy and reporting framework and advisory measures to build the project pipeline and scale up investment. And lastly, the technology and innovation working group would engage with the science and innovation community, identify the innovations required to enable pathways and recommend in measures to incentivize R&D in these areas. So that's a high level outline. Just a few points on the organizational design. So this is now looking at the secretariat themselves. Um, so as executive director, uh, it's my job to oversee the secretariat and to appoint the various technical leads for functional areas that would support the work of the commission. Our proposal is that we appoint technical leads for mitigation, for adaptation, for jobs and skills, for means of implementation, for information and communications, and for specific pathway planning processes and all of the associated working groups. Uh, we will have a secretariat, uh, currently that's uh, led by Mr. Makwarela, which will convene in minute meetings, remunerate commissioners and provide logistical support. Uh, as I indicated earlier, there are secondments from various social partners. We've already kindly had a uh, national treasury offer to second a senior manager to lead the mitigation work. And uh, we would encourage other social partners uh, to follow suit. Um, and as I also indicated earlier, we are undertaking an institutional review and we will come back to you with a proposal on the optimum positioning and structure for the Secretariat and how best to combine government and external support modalities. And, you know, obviously on the government side, they've, they've got to adhere to the PFMA and we don't want to compromise their ability to do that, but we do want to allow other um, and non-government components of the Secretariat to function. Um, this is a high-level provisional organogram. Um, and um, uh, we're still going to continue to work on it, but you can see we've divided uh, us up into five broad areas with specific tasks under each area. And it's a little bit of a matrix structure in which we've got mitigation and adaptation leads that uh, lead the work on that, but also champion particular work streams that will emerge. Um, I'm not gonna go through it in too much detail. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think we should um, debate the details of this because our institutional review will put further flesh on it and we'd like to come back to you on it. And then I've added just some, some work plans. Um, uh, uh, and the most important one is this one on the Just Transition Framework. Our, our intention would be to try and get it finalized before COP26. Um, uh, so the deadline for finalizing the work plan, uh, the, the framework is October. I know that commissioners are going to say, well, that's just too little time for the consultation that's involved. The only point uh, I want to make is that we all are building on the NPC process, not starting it afresh. So I do think we can follow 
an accelerated process to develop that framework. We've also at a sort of high level mapped out what the actual pathway planning process could look like. And the objective would be to, uh, for at least some of the initial pathway planning to be uh, ready by the second quarter of uh, next year. So commissioners, thank you for uh, listening to me. I think I've gone a little bit over my allocated time. Um, um, uh, just to repeat, we are uh, already uh, have a social media presence. We really want to encourage the commissioners to uh, tweet and post on our Facebook page and to engage. There's been an incredible uh, response already from the live streaming of this event. Um, uh, there's uh, a whole lot of stakeholders have, have commented. Some good, some bad. That's what you get when you uh, go public like this. Um, uh, so thank you for listening to this presentation and we look forward to your feedback.